Okay, next we're going to look at the physical factors that influence pulmonary ventilation. So we'll look at three factors that are going to determine the ease of air passage into and out of the lungs, which are the two steps of pulmonary ventilation. So those three physical factors are airway resistance, alveolar surface tension, and lung compliance. So first we'll look at airway resistance. And friction is going to be our major contributor to airway resistance, especially the major non-elastic source. It's going to impede gas flow. We actually can see here by this equation, which includes flow of air, change in pressure over resistance, that flow and resistance are going to be inversely related. So gas flow changes inversely with resistance. So if some impediment is introduced, that's going to decrease gas flow. If there's resistance to gas flow, it decreases. So it makes sense that they're inversely related. So resistance in the respiratory tree is pretty insignificant. The first part of the respiratory tree, the primary, secondary, even to a small extent, the, sec the tertiary bronchi, their diameters are huge. And then when the bronchi become bronchioles and get smaller, we get tons of branching. And this branching increases the total cross-sectional area. So even though the diameter of the airways get smaller, we get more of them. So for the most part, there's not a whole lot of resistance in the bronchial tree. We see the most resistance in the medium-sized bronchi because there's less of those than they are in the first part of the conducting zone, the primary and second, secondary bronchi. And they don't participate as much in bronchial dilation or constriction. But we'll see this resistance that's pretty insignificant and usually not found in the bronchial tree completely disappear at the terminal bronchioles. And that is because we're going to go from the conducting zone to the respiratory zone as we leave the terminal bronchioles. And the respiratory bronchioles and further structures towards the alveoli are not going to be participating in moving air from place to place. Instead, the respiratory zone structures are participating in gas exchange. So we can see here that we have the most resistance in the medium-sized bronchi. Not too much in the bronchi before that because their diameters are huge. And then we have less resistance in the smaller bronchioles because there's so many of them. It's a large surface area. Now, there are certain homeostatic imbalances that could introduce resistance, things like inflammation or mucus buildup that would block bronchioles that could introduce resistance and that resistance could slow airflow. So if airway resistance rises, that's going to slow or impede airflow. So it really can interfere with breathing movements. It can make breathing more strenuous. It can cause chest pain, especially if it's preventing life-sustaining ventilation or breathing in and breathing out. So this could occur during an acute asthma attack, that inflammation and mucus buildup could block bronchioles and prevent breathing completely. In this type of situation, you would want to give someone epinephrine. Epinephrine would dilate the bronchioles so they would get wider, and that would give that air that is trapped in the alveoli a chance to escape. It also would give this individual a chance to breathe in new air and promote gas exchange at the alveoli. Another physical factor influencing pulmonary ventilation is alveolar surface tension. So surface tension is the attraction of liquid molecules to one another at a gas-liquid interface. So essentially, if we were to look at the air spaces of the lungs, the alveoli, we would find that inside each one of them, there's a thin coat of fluid. We'll just call it a thin coat of water because this fluid has a high water concentration. And the fluid on one side of the airspace and the fluid on the other side of the airspace, they're attracted to each other because they're made up mostly of water molecules, and water has high adhesive and cohesive properties. So those two molecules want to be close together, and this actually makes the alveolus want to collapse. And this force is actually one of the forces that is promoting lung collapse, and if it wasn't for the external force of the rib cage trying to expand, we would see lung collapse. So this is a very important force that has to be monitored. So even though alveolar surface tension tends to want alveoli to shrink, we have a way to get around this strong force that could promote lung collapse. And that is the fact that we have surfactant produced in the alveoli. Surfactant is a detergent-like substance 
made by the type 2 alveolar cells, which are just cuboidal cells that we find in the air spaces. And these type 2 alveolar cells produce surfactant, and surfactant as a chemical embeds or interrupts the water bonds or the cohesive properties of the water that coats the inside of an alveolus. So we'll see that surfactant prevents alveolar collapse. There's still water inside the alveoli, but as long as there is also surfactant, the alveolar surface tension is not too great or not strong enough to promote complete lung collapse. There is a homeostatic imbalance related to an insufficient quantity of surfactant. It occurs usually in premature infants. It's called infant respiratory distress syndrome or ERDS. And this is when we see a great increase in that surface tension in the alveoli, so much so that they collapse during each breath. And that's because we have no surfactant to decrease the cohesive property between the water that coats the inside of an alveolus. So it takes a lot of extra energy for this infant to reinflate their alveoli each time they breathe in. And that's a major stressor on the bodies of the premature babies and their respiratory system. One of the reasons that this can affect premature babies over others is that a fetus doesn't produce enough surfactant to live outside the womb until the last two months of its development. Luckily, we can spray natural or synthetic surfactant into the newborn's air passageways and reduce that alveolar surface tension. And that introduces not only the ability for them to create their own positive pressure, but we can use positive pressure devices to even aid them along further and allow them to keep their alveoli open between breaths. In some severe cases, they might require mechanical ventilation. And mechanical ventilation could cause, after the fact, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is a chronic childhood lung disease that generally affects newborns or infants. And it can result in damage to the lungs and usually caused by that mechanical ventilator. And long-term use of oxygen can also do this or cause bronchopulmonary dysplasia. But most infants recover from this disorder and only some may have long-term breathing difficulty or dyspnea. Another physical factor that influences pulmonary ventilation is lung compliance. And lung compliance is pretty much how stretchy are your lungs. And the stroma of lung tissue is elastic tissue, stroma being kind of a network that supports the alveoli. And the basis of that for the lungs is this stretchy or distensible elastic tissue. So if we interfere with how stretchy your lungs are, that reduces lung compliance. Things that make your lungs stretchy is again, that elastic tissue, the distensibility of the lung tissue because of its makeup. Surfactant, which decreases alveolar surface tension, meaning that yes, the alveoli are trying to be as small as possible, but they're not trying to collapse because we've interfered with those water-water bonds. And we have a higher lung compliance if our lungs are stretchier than say someone else. So the stretchier the lungs, the higher the lung compliance. And lung compliance can be written mathematically, where C sub L is its compliance, and things we're comparing in this equation are changes in lung volume and the difference between intrapulmonary pressure and intrapleural pressure, which is the transpulmonary pressure. Things that could interfere with compliance that could reduce lung stretchiness is the development of scar tissue. Fibrosed scar tissue in the lungs doesn't stretch. Reduced production of surfactant, kind of like ERDS. Without surfactant, we would see increased alveolar collapse, and that would interfere with lung inflation. Or decreased flexibility of the thoracic cage. If it's not able to expand, it's not able to increase volume of the lungs enough to promote as adequate pulmonary ventilation as before, whatever caused the decreased flexibility of the thoracic cage. So, for example, tuberculosis is an infection that can cause fibrosis of lung tissue or cause non-elastic scar tissue to form in the lungs, and that would reduce compliance of lung tissue. Decreased production of surfactant, that could impair lung compliance that we just talked about, and any decrease in lung compliance will require the use of accessory muscles 
in order to breathe. It's going to make it harder to breathe if we decrease lung compliance. If we were to look at thoracic cage, things that could go wrong to decrease lung compliance, some type of deformity of the thoracic cage, maybe from a broken rib that didn't heal correctly, or ossification of the costal cartilage that connects the ribs to the sternum. If that ossifies, we have less movement of the thoracic cage and that would diminish its ability to expand and that would therefore diminish the ability of the lungs to expand and decrease the efficacy of pulmonary ventilation. And there could also be paralysis of the intercostal muscles. The external intercostal muscles are one of the inspiratory muscles and their contraction caused the rib cage to expand, kind of caused that rib cage to rise and that also caused the lungs to expand as well. So interference with that thoracic cavity so that it doesn't expand as well will decrease lung compliance. And we're gonna stop there. Next time we'll talk about assessing ventilation and look at the respiratory volumes and the respiratory capacities.